Pastor Pat. Amen. It was an amazing word. And, and, you know, he talked about the word prosper. That it doesn't mean about having a lot of money. It means going ahead, doing what God has called you to do. That's prosperity. Amen? Amen. Amen. Everyone say, I'm moving ahead. I'm moving ahead. With God. With God. To prosper. To prosper. That's right. Amen. Doing God's will. Amen. And, and of course, expectation. I, I, I like that, you know, because that's exactly how I feel. Is it today? That suddenly where God will come down and, and, and do amazing things, you know, the hope, the hope. You know, one of the things I have uh, found out about is, is the word ecclesia, which means assembly. You know, it doesn't mean congregation, it means assembly. And, and the word uh, ecclesia means, ek means to go out of, and then, of course, uh, clea is to call. So we're, we're called as an assembly to transact God's business. Amen. Amen. That's what Ecclesia is, and that's who you are, is the assembly. I am very grateful for these men and, and for stepping in for Phil Capuccio. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, he's not here. Nobody knows. We'll send him the CD. Yeah. I'll tell you what, that lady can, can, can help preach him just as good as anybody else. She has the anointing all on her own. But I, I want you to know that, that these men and pa Sister Ann and even Pastor Phil who couldn't be here are very dear men to me, close friends, and, and, and they mean a world to me. And I know they mean a world to this congregation of what they sow into this, into our lives, into this congregation. And, and I, I just, I am just so glad that God has put me with men like this to rub shoulders with, for my pastor to be able to speak into my life, there isn't anything that comes out of his mouth that doesn't minister to me and, and do things. It's just like, you know, every time he says something, I'm thinking, who told you? How did you know? But you know, that's what a man of God does. He hears the Holy Spirit and speaks those things. And, and I want you to know that this man... I dearly love, I, and Anne and his wife, uh, we go back a long time, a long time. And when I was looking for a covering pastor, I knew that this man had a pastor's heart, and I needed that gift in my, in my call, in my ministry. So, Pastor Paul, if you would come on up, could you put your hands together and honor this man? Give the Lord a good hand. Amen. Well, I want to have I want to have my wife come up here. I want to introduce her. Come on. She'll be sharing tonight, and uh, a lot of times that she's a little shy in sharing, but when she stands behind the pulpit, she's not shy. And. Of course, a lot of times when she speaks to me, she's not shy either. <laughs> but uh, we just we we're at we we just celebrated this past December 52 years of marriage. <laughs> that, that God, you know, God had redeemed our lives because we were on the verge of divorce. He redeemed our marriage. He redeemed our family. Uh, today we have six sons, 38 grandchildren, and 12 great grandchildren. And a lot of those are still in the church. They're growing in the church, growing in the things of God. And we thank God for that. And it's only be because of God. It's only because of Jesus Christ. And it's only because we surrender to him. It's not anything I've done. It's all what he's done. That's right. Okay, we're here because of him. Amen. And Pastor Pat Lyons has been a, a pastor to me, a friend to me. Uh, he's taken me under his wing in the prophetic and let me fly with him, if I could say that way, because we've flown to South America and Africa and different places and uh, really learned a lot. So this relationship that we have has just been growing for over 30 years. And same with your pastor, since I think it was 95 or something, and a little bit more than that, earlier than that, we, we met. And uh, it just, it, relationships keeps us going. But the relationship that I have with my wife, 
is so precious to me. Uh, we need to know, we need to cultivate our relationships in our families. We need to cultivate those things because there's a gifting and calling in all of us. And I wanted to introduce her this morning. I want her to say something. She'll be here tonight, but I know sometimes people don't go out in the evening, but I think you, you would really miss something. Not getting a CD, but seeing something in person and feeling the, the atmosphere in which she shares and the love she just. So I just wanted to greet you this morning. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you, you get the CD, it doesn't sound Please, like but... me. <laughs> I, I listen and I go, that's not me. <laughs> so, you know, you don't never hear yourself okay. the way others hear okay. you. you. But God bless you. And continue to grow in the Lord and to be faithful to the house of the Lord. And uh, tonight I'll give you the word of the Lord that he has given me to share. Jesus name and we thank you for the opportunity to be here we thank you for the anniversary that they celebrate God your faithfulness and the faithfulness of your servants and those that are here we ask God that you would bless we pray God your your presence to be here overwhelming us God, with your grace and your mercy, filling us, filling our lives with your presence and your power. We pray, Jesus, that you have your way today. Open our ears and our hearts to hear the things you have to say. And we thank you, God, so much for the opportunity to be here in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to share a couple of things with you this morning. So one part's going to be about ministry here. And the other part is just going to be about some things that you have. So I'm going to, my first question, I have a question for you. What is your favorite scripture in the Bible? And what I'm going to ask you to do is raise your hand. I'm going to take four of them, and I want you to tell me what that favorite scripture is in the Bible. What's your favorite scripture? Raise your hand if you got one. Sister Ann? Acts 16.31, me and my house shall be saved because that was her scripture that she stood on when she got saved before I did, year and a half, and that her and her house would be saved. And that's what we're seeing today. Okay? Anybody else? Favorite scripture? Children, obey your parents. I think there's a problem there. I think that's really a hope of a parent. And then the Bible also said parents don't bring your children to wrath. So there's a part that you have to do. What, what other favorite scripture? Come on. Amen. Praise God. I know the plans that I have for you. The power of God is being manifest. Okay. One more. God is for us who can be against. There's power. There's power in there. Yeah, the anointing over there. I'm going to get away from it. Okay, now. Now, my other question is to you, what's the most important scripture in the Bible? John 3.16? Nope. No, I'm not asking you. <laughs> Anybody else? Most important scripture in the Bible. It's all good. Not the most important. Most important scripture in the Bible is Genesis 1.1. In, in the beginning, God. If God didn't do it in the beginning, he's never going to do it in the end. And he's never going to be the one that does all the rest between Genesis 1 and Revelation 20. It's got to be God. It's God that started your life. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. If you keep that important in your life, if you understand that that's the most important thing going on, everything else will fall into line. You see how God orchestrates all the scriptures, but it began with him and ends with him. That's right, he's the Alpha and the Omega. So as we begin not only the ministry today, but as you, you think of the things that's going on in your life, it has to begin with God. And it began with God. It began with the things that he was doing, that he did in creation, and how he created man, how he created you and I, and how he did things that, that we have to understand something has changed 
in the dimensions of God. Something has changed in the world. When God created everything, he began to speak things into order. Amen? I like that scripture in Genesis where it says, that, and God created everything. Let me, let me go there. Genesis chapter 1, just for a second. Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Spirit of God is moving upon God's creation. You are God's creation. And the Spirit of God is moving upon your life. But the Bible says it was without form and void. There's no purpose here. It's there, but it doesn't have a fulfilling purpose. And it's like the Holy Spirit says to God, it needs something. What does it need? It needs you. It needs God. It needs the manifestation. And then God said, let there be light. Now, the sun and the moon were not made for, until the fourth day. So what was it that God let there be light? A revelation of his presence. Because without that, we have nothing. You and I need a revelation. Pastor Pat said something last night. That is very indicative of not only his testimony but mine. There came a time when he was, he was alone in a hotel crying out to God, I want something, I want change. And there came a revelation. And he said it so importantly that we had, he had an experience with Jesus Christ. I had an experience, April 11, 1976, with Jesus Christ at the altar in a church that Jesus Christ came in and saved my life, forgave me of all my sins, and then I really began to see my wife and my kids with new eyes and a new heart. It's a revelation. It didn't because I had the love, but God gave me love that was beyond the human ability to love. And when that revelation comes, there's, there's something that comes alive in us. When God begins to speak to us, life comes. So what's the next important scripture in the Bible? John 1.1. 1, 1. Put that scripture up. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Second verse. We're going to go down through three, so four. Would you read that? The second verse. He was in the beginning with God. Third. All things were made through him, and without him was nothing made that was made. And four. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. In him was life. Without Jesus Christ, we have no life. Without him speaking to our lives, and without him encouraging us, without him imparting into us, we have no life. And then in Genesis 2, it says, God made man out of the dust of the earth, and then he did something. He breathed into him the breath of life, and he became what? A living soul. In John chapter 3, when it talks about we need to be born again, that's when we become alive. When we're born again, all of a sudden, life comes into us because we've asked Jesus Christ to come in us, and he took the dust of our life, and he breathed into us. And we became more than we were before. Everything has changed. Has everything changed in you since that day you got born again? Has it changed? Or are we just kind of going through the same thing over and over? No, no. We might have some same things, but they're different. There's a, now a power, a life working in us that's totally different than ever before. As we come into this day, the 23rd anniversary, there was a time that your pastors came to our church back in January, I think it was 95? 95. First Sunday of the, of the month, of the year. And he didn't tell me he was in town, and all of a sudden he comes up to, a, opens up, we open the church up, and he comes in and sits down. I said, hey, pastor, how are you doing? We, we, why don't you share something? He's no, because I'm just here to pray. We got to wait for a weekend just to pray and fast, but we wanted to go to church. And so during the praise and worship, God began to speak to me about his life and share some things. And so I gave him a prophetic word about God was changing the mantle of his life into that to being a pastor. You remember that? And all of a sudden, it's the word of God that breathed new life into him. We need to know that God is it's not just me. The prophetic word is not because somebody's here, myself, Pastor Pat, Pastor Phil, Sister Ann. 
the prophetic word is God is using vessels to speak to your life. You're the most important things. When we have presbytery here, when we're praying over people, it's your duty and your privilege as the congregation to see what God and hear what God is saying to them and encourage them in their life, in their walk, to fulfill those things and to watch God do it. Watch him perform it. How long will it be? I don't know. I had somebody give me a, tell me a testimony. He said, uh, 20 some years ago, God gave him a word through his pastor that he would go to China. 20, 20 years later, he stepped into China. How long does it take to get the word prepared? How long does it take you to get prepared for the word? The word is ready, but there's a time that you and I need to be ready to receive and to do those things. So it's equipment then that has to come into our life to get ready for those things. And I believe that in the, through the prophetic word, it comes to us to tell us what God has for us. Let me share with you two prophecies, uh, one that I wrote out to some of the pastors that we're in fellowship with, and I was really encouraged by God this year, and actually by, by one of my uh, people in the church, and she knows that you know, we do these kind of things, and she said, Pastor, you've not written a prophetic word to, your pe- to the people. You need to do that. And I said, yeah, and yeah. And yeah, and yeah. I don't feel like I can write prophetic words. And then she'd come to me again a month later. She said, Pastor, did you write that letter yet? So I sat down and God gave this to me. And this is what I said to some people, and I believe it's good for you to hear. He said, I'm writing these few words to encourage you in your calling and your walk. To fulfill your destiny, these times do not define us. The Lord defines us with his calling in our lives. And the purposes for which he designed for you and me in our respective churches and fellowships. I believe in 2018 is a year of jubilee. We've already seen the Lord return to us things and people that have been stolen from us. This is a year that you must stand for your destiny. It is you that must declare and prophesy what the Lord has said to you. Rehearse and repeat the prophecies that were given to you in the times past because now is the time to receive them. You see, there's a time that we believe and there's a time we receive. You understand that? There's a time we believe and then there's a time we receive. Then I said this, I believe and agree with you for doors to be opened a way made, restoration, return, recovery, healings, and miracles. Do not say I cannot. God did this to me because he was saying some things to me in the beginning of the year, and I said, God, I can't. And he said, do not say I cannot and do not say no, for it's time for a new beginning. It's time for things to change in your life and my life. It's time for us to get those things. And a few weeks ago, my wife was ministering, and she shared a prophecy. She didn't write it. Somebody else did. But it really goes along with today, with the things that God is doing here in this church and the prophetic, and really into our lives and and getting some things ready. We're going through and being equipped. Listen to this. Thus saith the Lord, many today are standing in offices and trying to function in those offices, and they are not equipped. Many will not take the time to get their equipment. They get so excited over the call and the office that they don't realize that they have never been equipped. It takes time to get equipment, and most are in too big a hurry. They are operating in their timing and not mine, saith the Lord. I called Paul, I anointed Paul, but I didn't separate him to the call for a number of years. During those years, he was performing various ministry functions. I was using him, but mainly he was getting equipped. Then when he was fully equipped, I separated him unto the thing which I had originally called him. He was able to carry his ministry all the way through to the finish because he wasn't running on excitement alone. He wasn't teaching just doctrine. But he was a man called and anointed and imparting revelation, fully equipped to stand in faith 
until the time of full until the full accomplishment of his purpose had come to pass. Many that I've called and anointed are getting started with a bang, but then they fizzle out fast. Some make it for a while, but they struggle constantly and have no joy. All their joy is taken up, taken because they are in an area they're not equipped for yet. Some make it partway through, and then they, they can't go on because they're too weak to finish. Paul said, I've run a good race, I've finished my course, I've kept the faith. I say to you, I'm looking for people called, anointed, equipped, and separated unto me. I'm looking for people who will go all the way through to the finish. But remember, when one is intending to run a race, they will never finish if they haven't spent long time preparing for that race. If they jump the gun, so to speak, they get started too soon, they, they risk of being disqualified and unfit to run. But the one who knows he is called to run the race prepares himself patiently, waits for the starting block of the starter to sound the trumpet, and then runs patiently and diligently. This runner, I say, will finish the race. So with all of the things that we have before us today, we have so many things that, are, that are, we're in competition for. We have, we're being forced to, and we, we want to run ahead of what God is saying. And that's where failure comes. We can have a word that we're going to accomplish things, but there's a timing in all things. And it, before the timing comes the equipping, the surrender of our hearts and our minds and our wills to the will of God. That's the biggest thing. How do I accomplish this, God? When God called me to the ministry, you know what I said to God? Do you know how hard it is to start a church? Yeah, he laughed too. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, I started with 12. You know, weren't very good, you know. But God turns around, and if you're willing, if you're willing and seeking him, then he'll guide you into the truth, and he'll put people around you that will help you. He'll put people around you that will correct you. Because we need to be corrected. Are we willing to hear the correction? The Bible says this, to anyone that is really hungry, every bitter thing is sweet. Even the truth that brings you to correction, you need in your life. Because if we can't be and won't be corrected, we'll fail. We'll fall down. So God has some things that he's saying to us. And some of them are... are and I like, God is, God is a God that says, he tells us things short-term, mid-term, and long-term. And he begins to reveal things. So when there's a prophecy over somebody's life, it usually comes around, and I, I look at it like this, it's like taking a book and reading some chapters ahead of where I am, and I want to I read chapter 16, and it looks exciting, the title looks exciting, and I read it, and it means nothing because I haven't read 13, 14, and 15, because they prepare us for what's coming. Same thing in your life. Pastor shared with me a, a prophecy that Pastor Pat gave him back in 2012, this morning. And during a time when Pastor Phil and I were here and Pastor Pat, and he shared with him a, a prophecy that you're going to stand before other pastors and teachers and you're going to be doing this and doing that. And there was no way back in 2012 that that would happen. But today in 2018, it's fulfilled. So we have a fulfillment of things six years later. Well, why wasn't it done then? Because he wasn't ready. God gives you these things to give you and I hope. He has a hope that he wants to put in you and I. But that hope turns around and said, okay, what do I need to do to prepare? Timothy says that uh, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, preparing for the things that God has for us. So God may say you're going to be a pastor, you're going to be an evangelist, you're going to be a teacher. Well, if, you've never, if you're not studying for those things, you're not preparing, then when you stand up to teach, you'll have nothing to say. And you'll do more, you do more harm than good. But if you prepare all of a sudden, and we take those small baby steps, I can't imagine, I know what your heart was like back in 95 and 92 when we first met and all the things that went on, but I can't imagine, I wasn't here for the first service. How was that first service? Mm 
you can't see it sometimes to it. You know, you just you, I'm shaking inside. It just, you know, I'm rattled. I'm, you know, this is, what am I doing here? I did this exact same thing. What in the world, God, are you doing? Can I leave? No, you're called here. That's the difference. People can leave because they're not called. But when you're called, you can't leave. There's no option. Why are we? My wife and I would go to church on a Wednesday and even Sunday night, and no one else was in the building to a teaching on Sunday night or, or Wednesday night. No, but I would stand up and I'd preach to her. I'd teach to her. Why? I had to be faithful in the call of God. Not faithful because somebody's watching me, but because he's watching me. Can you be faithful when no one else is looking at you, patting you on the back, encouraged? Can you be faithful to God when no one else is there? We have to be faithful to God. God said, this is the time the door is open. This is the time, and this is the word that you're going to preach. I'm going to do it. There was a story of a man a number of years ago who, was, who God said, to him, I want you to go open this church up in this city, and he didn't live there. And so him and his daughter went to this church, and they found this church, and God just opened the door, and the building's for rent, and he went in, and they, they said, can we rent this building? He said, yeah. He said, I want to hold a revival. He said, okay, you know, do whatever you want to do. They advertised, cleaned the church, him and his daughter for a couple of weeks, and they held a three-day meeting. Not one person showed up. At the end of the third day, God said, go home. God, nothing happened. Go home. Several years later, I think it was six or seven years later, he was invited back to the same church. The church is full, got people in there, and he's just looking around and said, wow, you know. So he, they asked him to, to preach and share, so he preached. And a guy came up to him afterward. He's one of the elders in the church now. He comes up to him and he said, hi, I, I remember you from a number of years ago. He said, what do you mean? Well, when you were here preaching, you know, seven years ago, he said, no one was here. He said, I was here. I, I was outside listening through the window. I gave my life to Jesus because you did what you were supposed to do. And this church is here today because you obeyed God. Awesome. You go, what? I did nothing. It's not for you to see results. It's for you to be faithful. God is the one that's required for results. You are the one that's required to obey. That's all it is. So I got a couple more questions for you. Why are we here? How did we get here? And what's next? First question is, why are we here? We're here because of Pentecost. A couple of weeks ago, we celebrated Pentecost. What happened on the day of Pentecost? It was a day that God breathed into the church. He breathed into man just as he did in Genesis chapter 2, and he became a living soul. The church came alive. Man came alive to the things of God. 120 people in the upper room, both men and women, came alive to the things of the kingdom of God. They heard something. Acts 2 says, that suddenly they heard a sound. There's a sound that came. There was a, something happened. They heard God breathe. And God speak to them. And all of a sudden, you know, we, we go on and we, we, we see that, uh, that man is now speaking the word. He's, pro, he's, he's speaking in tongues and doing all kinds of things. We, it sounds like foolishness. But everybody that's on the outside heard them speak in their language the wonderful things of God, the miraculous things of God that they had, they had they'd forgotten about. All of a sudden, these men who didn't know these languages were speaking perfect what a dialect or whatever it was. When Azusa, happened, when Azusa Street happened back in 1901, they turned around and they found out they sent dialect people from Washington, D.C. to find out what the language that they were speaking. And they were speaking perfect dialects of places they've never been. And that's how they sent out 3,000, I think it was over the years, 3,000 missionaries around the world to bring the gospel in languages that people never learned. A thing of God, an act of God, the power of God. The, the miraculous of God. We need to see that again today. We need to hear of those things today. So we're here because of Pentecost, because something happened 2,000 years ago that changed the dimensions and the atmosphere of the world. 
God breathed again into the earth, into man, and he became alive to the things of God, to the kingdom of God, just as it was in Genesis 2. On the day of Pentecost, the Lord God breathed into an upper room, those people that are gathered, and they were seeking for what the Lord Jesus promised. Now, we got a great advantage because we read by history what God promised. But could you imagine? You don't have a history book. You don't have anything here. You don't have any understanding, really, of, of the things of God. You, I mean, you read the, the five books of, the, of, the, of the, the, the law. You read all those kind of things. You even read Proverbs and Psalms. But you have no idea what carry for the promise that is coming to you from the Father. What does that mean? I think Pastor Pat said it last night. Those that saw him go was over 500. Less than 10 days later, there's only 120 people in the upper room. So 380 people got discouraged because they didn't know what to wait for, and they got tired of waiting. How many here get tired of waiting? Sometimes we get tired of waiting for our wife. We get tired of waiting for our husband. We get tired of waiting for our children. We get tired of waiting for this to happen, that to happen. We get tired of waiting. Come on! Your impatience doesn't make anything go any faster. It only brings you frustration. We need to learn to wait patiently. That's not easy, but it's necessary. So they're waiting for something. They have no idea what it looks like, what it feels like, what it tastes like, what's going to happen. One thing's for sure. The end of Acts 1, they put somebody else in the place of Judas. Listen to this. When divine order is restored, the blessings come. Listen to this again. When divine order is restored in the leadership, the blessings are released. When you and I get in order, God will release the blessings. It's important for you and I that we, we build that relationship with our spouse, with our family. Because if it doesn't happen in home, it's never going to happen in the church. Home has to be first. That's right. Get that divine order in the house is going to have divine order in the church. So they're waiting for something. To, yeah, okay, they got Matthew. It's funny because the last time you ever heard of his name in the Bible, he's elected to be the, the, the guy that takes Judas's place the divine order, and they're, they're still in prayer. It's all the same day. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were in one accord. Well, boy, that's a, that's a, that's a big one accord. <laughs> one accord. <laughs> that's, that's an unfamiliar statement today in, in the body of Christ, all alone the world. You know, one accord, one purpose, one desire. We're just here to seek God. We don't even know what we're seeking for. We're just seeking him. God, you said, and we're waiting. We're looking to you. We're worshiping you. Can you worship God while you're waiting? Can you praise God while you're waiting? I think Pastor Pat said it so eloquently last night. He said, when I got to a place I lost my hope, I start praising God. I start thanking God. I start remembering God. I start proclaiming, you know. We magnify the Lord. The da Psalm, the David the psalmist says, Magn oh, magnify the Lord. with me. Let us exalt his name together. And that's where we have to be. We have to do those things in our lives. Then all of a sudden, we find the sudden. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Just to take a look at a couple of scriptures real quick. Divine order was first, verse 1, one through 4. And when the day upon Pentecost was fully come. In other words, that's the time now that it's, we're into the time of celebration. So it's somewhere around 9 o'clock in the morning. If the celebration is going to start. The feast is going to happen. That's why everybody's gathered in Jerusalem. But these people were in an upper room. They were in there just seeking God. So now the day of Pentecost has fully come. They were one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. A sound from heaven. They heard something. Our ears have to be open to the things of God. And it came from heaven. It didn't come from the windows. It came down and out. As a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues as a fire and sat upon each. Can you imagine? You're sitting there praying. Maybe you got your eyes closed. Maybe you're just worshiping. I don't know what you're doing. And all of a sudden, you hear something. 
Do you ever, do you ever be in prayer and all something falls? Somebody walks into the hallway, the phone rings, you look, kind of look up. Can you imagine hearing this sound of a muddy rushing wind and it didn't come from the windows in? It came from the, the ceiling down. And you begin to, what is that? And you look around and all of a sudden on his head or her head, there's fire, there's flames of fire, there's something going on. You go, what in the world? And all of a sudden a sound comes out of you. Something is happening. And it's not anything we worked up, conjured up, looked for. It's something that's sovereignly done by God. He filled them with the Holy Ghost. And he began, to, all the, the scriptures of Ezekiel began to fulfill. I'm going to put a new heart and a new spirit and a new life within you. That the, the tablet of your stony heart I'm going to remove. That I may put a tablet I can write my word on. God is writing his word on your life, my life. And it becomes the law of us. Not something that's a, a derogatory or something that binds us, but something that directs us. It protects us. When God set the parameters of the earth, he said, this is as far as you can go. Why? Because that's the blessing that I have. When you step out of it, you're going to be in trouble. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven. that was a mushy, rushing mighty wind. So suddenly, we begin to hear something. This is the new birth. It's so funny because on that day, not only new birth, but new baptism. And Pastor Pat said it last night. When he asked God to come in, and he, the only prayer I know is our Father which art in heaven. His birth came in and his baptism came in. We sometimes look at it as separate events, and they are, because we need to be born again. The Bible says you need to be born again to even see the kingdom of God, but you need to be born of the water and the spirit to enter the kingdom of God. You know, ladies, when you go shopping, you go down through the, through the uh, you go by the windows and it says sale 50%. My wife don't look at 50% anymore. She looks at 80%. It's, if it's not 80%, she's not looking. But can you imagine going by the store and it says everything in here is free, but you never go in. You can't get what's on the inside because you never enter the door. And for us to enter the kingdom of God means I need to be born, born again by the water, baptism, and born again by the spirit. So that I have the, now I have the authority and the privilege to walk into the kingdom of God and receive what God has on the other side. That's as, si as simple as I can put it. I want to believe for my salvation. I'm born again. But then there's another process. There's another step that God has for us that we can be, we can be filled with the Spirit and water baptized and filled with the Spirit and enter into we can never enter into. If we've not been baptized in water or spirit, we never enter fully into the things of God. You can go to the beach and stick your toes in the water. But did you go swimming? No. You went to the beach. Got your feet wet. You didn't go swimming until you get immersed. And you and I need to be immersed in the things of God, both in water baptism and in spirit baptism. Amen. We need to be immersed inside and out that my life has totally changed. All old things pass away. I remember a number of years ago we did a water baptism in, the, in Lake Erie. It was a little lake on the, on the east side or west side of us called Raccoon Park. And we went down, we had a baptism. About 25 people got baptized. It was a Sunday afternoon. Monday, they closed the beach down for pollution. I said, that's all that sin that's floating around down there. Literally, they closed, they put a warning. Don't go to Raccoon Park, pollution, pollution. And we were there Sunday. Huh? It's all that sin floating around. Why? Because we're washed. I don't know about you. I've been water baptized several times just because I, I just need it. I think I'm going to go. I want, I want to experience it again. How many of you ever come to the altar more than once? Why? Wait a minute. I was saved one time. Why do I need to come to the altar? Because I want to have that new experience. I want to have something change in my life. I, I feel like I need to get a refreshing. All those kind of things. So I come to the altar again. I've gone. I've done baptisms and turn around and say, I, I think I need to be baptized again. Have my sons baptize me. I feel better. Is there anything wrong with it? No. If you don't want to, you don't have to. But I want to get close to God, as close as I can, to where He is. My next breath. And however it takes, whatever it takes, for me to get close to him, I want it. And in reality, I, I would love to walk back into the church that I got saved in, but now it's a doctor's office. It's all changed. 
But I know exactly where I was at the altar when I got saved. I could tell you the spot. I would love to go back to that because I want to remember what God did. Because it will help me to go forward. Not take me back, to go forward. There's times we have to remember what God has done for us in order to remember, remind us what he's doing for us right now. Where he's going to take us. Amen. All by the power of his spirit. So 23 years ago, that began to happen to your pastor. A word of prophecy began to come over their lives. It brought some change, peace, excitement, direction. The atmosphere changed. The direction became clearer. Questions were answered. A new dimension to the soul became alive. Not because I said anything, but I believe the Lord began to reveal more than what I could say because they truly sought the will of God. More was said over just, not just a few words I said, what was God continually saying to you as you took that trip home? In our lives, we can have many directions come to us, but not all of them lead us to the, to the will of God. That comes because we seek him and we seek godly counsel and those that we trust to keep us on that track that we need to have. The second question, how do we, how do we get here? We got here because, the word of, because of the word of God alone? No, but by prayer and soul searching. The word of God got you started. But you keep it by prayer and seeking God and worship. It's a combination of all those things. It's not one thing. If it was one thing, we'd do one thing and we'd, we'd do it good, but we'd let everything else go. There's so many things. Those are the things that just get us started. They excite us and they, and they open our eyes to those things. But there has to come that soul searching, heart searching. And faith that only comes from the Lord. I remember shortly after I started pastoring the church, we opened the church up in uh, April of 85. And I had heard somebody teach this one time. I didn't understand it. He said, you need to pray for the heart of a pastor if you're going to step in the office or a heart of a teacher or evangelist, whatever it is. And so one, sun, one Saturday night, I just went to the church by myself. It was like 11 o'clock at night. And just turned one light on, went in, and it was, we were in a doctor's office. It was just a little office area that we, we had rented. And I just went to the altar I had there, and I cried out. I said, God, I heard that there's a heart of a pastor that you have for me. You may call me, but God, I, I want the heart of a pastor. I've been an evangelist. I've been a, a youth pastor. But I want, the, I want to have the heart of a pastor that you have for me, for the people that you're going to put in my life. Because I don't know how to do this. And I spent a little time there, and all of a sudden, something began to change. Something came over me, came in me. And God, by his sovereignty, I don't know how he does it, but gave me a heart of a pastor. Gave me somebody who, who cares about what's going on in somebody's life. And I don't, I don't, I don't have an education to, to say I've done all these things, but God gave me a heart. That's the anointing that he, goes, that he gives you with the calling that he equips you with. And we have to seek those things. And God, how do I do this? Whatever stage God puts you in, whether it be a deacon or an elder or a treasurer or whatever, account, or even your business, you've got to have the heart, the wisdom for it and the heart for those things. Because those are the things that are going to make you excel above, excel above all your fellows because it's not your business smarts, it's your anointing. That changes everything. And God gives you wisdom to do, to have witty inventions, to do more than you could ever thought of doing before. God has these things for us. You trusted, He trusted you with His will for these people that you've touched all of these years. When God says, like this, son and daughter, I trust you. I trust you with my will. My I'm trusting you with these sheep. That's a lot. That's a lot. I'm trusting you with these people I'm putting in your life. I'm trusting you with this city. I'm trusting you with all of these things. If all the people were here you'd have to move. 
of all the people that you've touched over these 23 years plus, not just people that came through this door, but people that you touched outside this door, if all of those people that had really turned and, and not only just accepted the Lord, but accepted the ministry that you have, this place wouldn't be able to hold it. And sometimes we wonder, and so Pastor Pat said, well, you know, God's called me to Belmont, and I'm, I got 40 people. I got about 60 or 80, and that fluctuates. But God, is that all we have to do is to do what God called us to do. We're not accountable for results. We're accountable for what we do. And you've done it. You've sowed seeds. You sowed the word. You sowed love. And that's all required of you that you grow the harvest. He grows the harvest. Pastor Norbert and Sister Jane, you've been faithful in what the Lord has given you. That's so important. You've been faithful. So what's next? That's the third question. What's next? Well, that's yet to be seen. But things are in place for some mighty acts of the Lord. He's already placed you in a place of influence and authority that we see in, in the position that you have today. And what's next for the church? I'm going to leave that up to the prophetic word. But let God always be right and every man a liar. There are going to be doors open. There are things that are going to take place. There are things that God wants to do. Let's go to a scripture in Ephesians. I might have shared it here before, but recently in the last several months, this has been coming back to me, back to me so many times. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 through 19. This is Paul's prayer for the church of Ephesus, and I believe it's Paul's prayer for you. If, if Paul could have prayed for you, would you remember the prayer that Paul might have prayed? Because prayers can be prophetic. Let me say this to you very, very profoundly. There's many times we just pray for somebody, but there's a prophetic utterance, a prophetic word, there's a prophetic unction in the middle of all of that. You may think that's just a prayer. No, it's what you hear, what you perceive. Are you hearing God say something? Are you hearing something happen? So verse 17, so Paul begins to pray and he says, he prays, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus. You and I need wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because without wisdom and revelation, we have nothing. Paul said, I was, I've been appointed a, a demon because of all the revelation that I've had. Paul had revelation that nobody else has ever had. Paul had revelation of communion. He had revelation of faith. He had revelation of grace. He had a revelation because he experienced all of these things. It's not saying that Paul and John didn't. John had a revelation of the love of God. Oh, and he calls himself the beloved. <laughs> no one else write of John the beloved. No, uh, Peter said something about, you know, that John, the favorite, you know. And that's how he looked at himself. Verse 18, he's, again, he's praying that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling that you may know what is the hope of his calling in your life for to be a pastor, to be a teacher, to be a song leader, to do whatever, to touch children, to be a children's teacher. What is the hope? There's a hope he's given you. Not just a calling, there's a hope in the calling. There's a purpose for it that he's designed for your life. The hope of heaven for this church he's put in you. And then it's your job to impart that hope to other people, to the generations following behind us. To impart it and to release it. So we have one part as pastors, but then we have to quit doing all the jobs and let other people begin to do those things that God has called them to do. You understand? That there are so many more things that God has for us and we could get done if everybody else would be imparted and everybody else would pick up they're, they're a part and begin to do those things that God wants us to do. There's a hope. And what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? What is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe? 
greatness of his power, the spirit of the living God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that worked all the miracles through him, is living you and me and you and me. We just haven't released that. We haven't touched into that. We get the tingle every once in a while. We feel good every once in a while. We get the shakes once in a while. But the shakes aren't enough. The tingle isn't enough. The feeling isn't enough. We need to do something with what God's given. We need to believe that he's put us in that authority. We need to stand those things that God has given to you. He's given you the city. He's given you this church. He's given you these people. We need to do something for the glory of God. The exceeding greatness of his power is in us. According to the working of his mighty power. According to what he's doing in you, what he's already done. So if he's already done these things and we remember those things for these last 23 years, what's the next 23 years going to look like? What's the next seasons of our life that he has for us? That you may know what is the hope of his calling. And it doesn't come because he explains everything. He gives you a little glimpse, just a little light, just a little caption. And we have to begin to seek what he wants for us. Begin to search out those things. Become diligent. Become faithful in those things so that we could have what he wants in us. And what he's given to you is heaven, the kingdom of heaven. The Bible says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's coming through your life and my life. Jesus said, don't preach the kingdom far off. I need the kingdom now. Everybody knows or believes that when we get to heaven, we're all going to be healed. Is that true? Sin's gone, no crying, no pain, all that kind of stuff. But I want that now. I mean, I... I I mean, I don't really need to get healed in heaven. It's already there. Yeah, I want the kingdom of God to come in my life. But do we want it just to get healed? Or do we want to know the healer? See, so many times we, we focus on his hands and not his face. If we get Jesus, we get everything that comes with him. Woo-hoo! Hallelujah. That's what I need. I need Jesus. I need him. I need him. I need Jesus in all my life so that I could be what he wants me to be and do the things he wants me to do. And that's what God wants for you. He's put a hope in your life. He's put a calling in your life. Listen. So many times I've had people come to me and say, Pastor, God called me to this church. I said, that's wonderful. And then God's called me out here. Who gave you that word? Where'd you get that at? You know, well, I feel. Well, I'm, I like what one brother said. I'm going to give you a piece of lead, and every time you feel like something, just put it in your pocket. Say, I feel lead. <laughs> I feel lead. <laughs> you can't keep transplanting a plant. You'll dwarf it. It'll never become to the fullness that you need it to be. And we got to stick through some of the rough times in order to become what God wants us to be. And knowing that God put us in a place because it's here where we're going to grow. It's not somewhere else. I've had a lot of people in my church that were very, had a lot of potential. And just at about the time I'm giving, going to give them promotion, they would come in and say, Pastor, I'm going to leave. I'm going to go here. Go. I'm not going to stop them. I'm not going to drag them. I did that one time. One time. I went after a guy who helped me start the church. He was with us eight years. And it was a real blessing to me, a real friend of mine. And then he got offended over something. And I couldn't even, t- he doesn't even know what it was about. And he left the church. And a guy told me, you need to go and restore him back to the church. So I went. I went and I, I talked to this guy for three hours. We cried. We prayed. He came back to my church. It was after a couple of months. Came back to my church. He left three months later and took six more families with him. And those families have been destroyed for a number of years until they got decided to get right, and they went back to other churches. Six families left my church because I brought one back. If they want to leave, let them leave. Don't go after them. Oh, the Bible says that he left at 99. He left out, he left after one who was lost, not one who walked away. 
There's a difference. We can get lost in our life, and we know those that are lost. We can go after them. But those that walk away, love you, brother, love you, sister. Remember, I'll always be here. You know, I've had people come back to me, say, Pastor, I'm really sorry I, I missed God and left you. And I said, you're welcome back anytime. But sometimes, you know what it is? Shame stops them from returning. Yes. It's the guilt. And I said, I, I don't give you any guilt. I'm not giving you any shame. I love you, man. I forgave you a long time ago. Really, I had a, a girl come into our church. And I was doing some work in the office, and she came in, and she said, Pastor, I just want to say I'm sorry, blah, blah, blah. You know, well, I said, sis, it's okay. You're welcome. I don't know if I can come back. I said, look, if you walk in the door, you're going to find out people really love you. They're not, most people have changed over the years, so you don't, you don't see the same people that were here, you know, so it's like a swinging door. You've got new people, you know. I don't have a different service. Same service, just different people. But God is, God is the one that's faithful, and he's looking for faithfulness out of you. Oh, I had this little note. I like CPR, Christ's power of resurrection. We need a little CPR in our life. I need God to breathe into me. Amen? Praise God. So it's been a blessing and an honor to be with you, and we pray that God would just anoint this house and anoint you, and re you realize that it's God calling. It's not us. It's not even your pastor. Your pastor recognizes that God has something for you, but then it's God that's going to equip you as you begin to seek him and do what he wants. Amen? Let's, let's pray. Father, we just thank you, God, for the opportunity to be in your house, to share this word. We thank you for this house. We thank you for the anniversary. We thank you for the fa faithfulness of your pastors and those that have been here. We truly ask, God, that you would bless them, enrich them, and God, pr perform your will over their lives, not just today. We celebrate the, the anniversary and the celebration of what you have. We truly ask, God, that you would bless for what you have in the future for this church and the people here in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.